Nuts! Hey, this is Greg Coy from The Breakdown. If you're new here and checking out the channel on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Also, feel free to follow me on Twitter, at Greg Hoyt L-E-T. Anyway, let's get on to the video. It's Greg Hoyt from Red Voice Media. I've got John Doyle, the infamous John Doyle, uh, over here. Uh, was recently on TimCast, and he has an interesting uh, story regarding his time here at the TPUSA event because it almost didn't happen. Uh, care to uh, fill us in on that? Well, uh, I don't really know what the details were. All I know is that um, I got an email after I got my confirmation email. A few weeks later, I get an email basically saying that my attendance was revoked. They didn't provide a reason as to why. So what I suspect happened where there were some uh, staffers maybe who weren't exactly in love with my flavor of political dialogue, probably women, frankly, but it's okay. We made a couple phone calls. We got back in. It's just a little glitch in the system, so hopefully that doesn't happen in the future. But we love it. I mean, we're enjoying AmFest, the best political event of the year. It's a great time. So when it comes to uh, AmFest and, and Turning Point USA in particular, it's kind of a, at least, you know, a conservative ink, vanilla conservatism, uh, a little bit of a departure from or your style of, sure. or, or your interpretation of uh, conservatism. What, what's, what is your take on the TPUSA version of conservatism versus the brand that you're trying to usher into the country? I think, honestly, on, on net, it's a positive because Turning Point USA has achieved something very unique in right-wing politics, which is they have managed to make a conservative event for young people that isn't, like, dorky. I mean, it's actually fun. People look forward to it. The visuals are outstanding. And you compare it to some of these other events, and, you know, they're good, but they're not quite good. And actually, a lot of the top people at Turning Point, particularly Charlie Kirk, have gotten a lot better on the issues in the Trump era. I mean, these are people who were maybe never Trump before, but now they're, like, getting better on all sorts of issues, anti-white racism, immigration, things like that. So I'm pretty optimistic on the basis of that. Um, and honestly, if it weren't for Turning Point, I mean, what would fill the vacuum, if not this? They've put together a very sophisticated organization, and they seem to just be getting better and better in terms of the events, in terms of how accurate the people are on the issues, even the people they brought to speak. I mean, you've got Michael Knowles, Matt Walsh, very good social conservatives who are authentically right-wing, so I'm pretty optimistic on the basis of that, though I will concede there are a lot of people here who aren't quite there yet, but uh, we'll, we'll get them there. Awesome, awesome. So one thing that I find particularly interesting is the shift uh, of the conservative grift uh, if you remember back on you know platforms like YouTube in 2015, 2016, there was this huge conservative push. And then as the years drifted on, as 2020 approached closer, you started to see the grifters for who they were, and they started shifting. Uh, case in point, you have people like Connor Avalon and other, ind other individuals like that, which you recently debated, apparently. What's your opinion on that? Do you think they were genuinely conservative from the onset, or do you believe that they may have just been riding the wave? Yeah, I mean, they might have had a vague interest in politics, which is fine. I mean, you'll notice that people who work in politics, they're kind of weird. And it just is what it is. I mean, you have to have a certain level of eccentricity to really care about this stuff at a deep level. So I think that they probably caught wave of what was going on. They were vaguely interested in it, vaguely had opinions on it, and then found, I guess you'd say, a niche market to garner attention. And that's what they did. And then, you know, it kind of wore off after a while. I mean, all of Hunter Avalon, for example, all of his videos were... Uh, fat people should not be accepted as beautiful. Uh, gay people are okay, but they just take it a little bit too far. Feminists are generally annoying, and that was like basically all of his content. And, you know, you can only run that for so long. Eventually, the hourglass is going to be up, and you're going to need to go somewhere else. And, Hunter, that was your problem. You always were just stuck in 2016. You couldn't evolve past there. So, you know, he's uh, not exactly as relevant anymore. But that's really the grift, and there's always going to be a grift. I mean, even with the Trump era, you've got the MAGA grifters, all of these people who are like, oh, look at me. I'm like, make America great again. I love Donald Trump. They're not good on immigration. They're not good on foreign policy, on trade, all of the things that really define what Trump is. But they like it. You've got these women for example. They try to be models in Los Angeles, but they're not pretty enough. So all of a sudden now they're talking heads at these events. You know who you are. So that is a problem on the one hand, but on the other hand, it is good. You know, you've got older people, you've got younger guys coming in here. We need pretty young women attracting people to our events. So they do serve a purpose. Maybe we shouldn't give them so much power, but I digress. So I think, uh, yeah, I would say that. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, so what is your take on the current uh, mainstream media's um, implosion, explosion, whatever you want to call it, regarding Musk and Twitter? Do you think the acquisition by Musk was a net positive 
uh, do you think the mainstream media is, you know, blowing their lid for no good reason? What, what's your take on the whole situation with that? So I've been an Elon Musk fan before it was cool, I will say. I On my first video, I've got the Tesla sticker on the laptop. I've always been really inspired by this guy. You know, he seems to vindicate the sort of great man theory of history that you will have these larger-than-life figures who come along, like Donald Trump, like Elon Musk, who just, like, do great things. Maybe not good things, maybe not bad things, but great insofar as they're very impactful. They change the conversation. So that's what I see with Elon Musk. And look, we can complain about the way he's handling it. He's maybe taking too long to restore certain accounts, my own account, for example. But ultimately, he has done more for free speech and for Republican voters than our own leadership class has done in the last 10 years, where all the censorship really became bad. And it took literally this eccentric, probably autistic billionaire spending $44 billion on this platform for that to happen. Our leadership was never going to do that for us. And now that we've gotten a taste of it and we see what it looks like, that allows us to sort of, I guess, really, uh, I don't know, declare total war on our own leadership class, I guess I would say, because it's like, look, this billionaire is doing all this. We elect you to do this. Why aren't you doing this? And so I think it kind of gives us permission to put more pressure on them for that because uh, it provides a frame of reference. All right. So uh, one last thing. Tell, uh, tell the people where they can find you. You can find me at youtube.com slash John Doyle, twitter.com slash Comrade Doyle, maybe, we'll see, and uh, Instagram at johndoyle.jpg. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.